Hello, Gretchen. Um, just in case I'm not a familiar face, um, I'm not sure if Corin actually spoke to you or not, but um, just a heads up, I'll be taking the grade 10 IT from now on. Um, obviously, I don't know how you did it in the past. I don't know how you're going to do it in the future. Um, but yeah, we're going to try our best. We're going to do what we, we're going to try and do, okay? Um, the only thing I am going to ask, I don't know how um, the muting and the um, video worked. All I'm going to ask for the host is um, I'd like you to sort of keep the the microphones off until you want to ask a question. So I'd really prefer that you actually log on and physically ask me the question, then maybe type it um, in the chat, purely because, I mean, we can all get on on a tangent and I'd rather it come through as I'm going through than um, I possibly miss something along the way. Um, it's all just for your own benefit. So that's all. Um, what I'd like to say. Uh, I'm just going to wait a little bit more. Obviously, we're only going to start at 10. Uh, we still have a few minutes now. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that wants to chat, anyone that wants to cover anything with me before we start. Um, but yeah. Good morning, teacher. This is uh, How are you? Clearly no one wants to speak to me. Clearly Monday is not treating you very well. Are you not here? Um, quick question, can someone just say something back to me? Because I think someone said that my speakers are not working properly. What? So I can hear scuffling, if that helps. Hello. Ah, okay, cool. Okay, cool. So my speakers are good because I'm answering you, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I can now see that uh, there are more people joining us today. So I just wanted to say uh, I'm Amy. 
in case you didn't know, uh, I teach grade 10 IT and CAT, and I teach grade 11 IT. Uh, just a heads up, I want this to be a little bit more interactive um, than maybe you used to. I don't know how this has worked in the past. Um, but if you have a question, please, if possible, I would prefer it if you actually asked me the question. So just maybe unmute at that specific, make the image invisible. It needed to change the width of the property of the form to 500. And then what needed to happen was it then had to change these properties of this label using code. So we didn't want you to go to the object inspector and physically go change the font name to Chilla. We wanted you to do this in physical Delphi code when we ran this form. But what does that actually look like? Cool. So if we look at this um, screenshot of the form over here, we get something called the reset button. Okay. And if we want to disable the reset button, we then say, well, enabled needs to be false. If we want to make our image invisible, well, we then need to say our image, when it's visible, needs to be false because the opposite of visible is invisible. So for it to have then been visible, it must have been true, but we didn't want it to be seen. We wanted it to be invisible. So that's why it's false. Cool. Then it said, change the width property of the form to 500. So we literally went to the form. Okay. This is the actual name of the form that we created in the beginning. We gave it that name and we set it to 500. Then it says that we must change these label properties using code. So how do we do that? The top property to 25, we literally call the label we call the property top and we set it to 25. We then looked at the left property to 25 and we then said, we'll go to the output label, let's go to the left property and we set it to 25. Literally as simple as that. Cool. Then it asked us to change the font name to Chilla. How do we do this? The first thing that we need to know is we need to go to the actual label like we've done before. So we go to our label. Then essentially we're working backwards. This in our case, we say we want font name to Chilla. So we want to then start with our font name. Okay. But we don't call it font name. We say, well, let's go to the font. And once we've accessed our font, what is the name of that font that we want to call? We want to call it Chilla. Okay. We put it in these little um, apostrophes because Delphi reads Chilla as an actual word and finds it in the stored font names in the background. Cool. Then it asks us to change the font size to 30. We go to the label, we go to the font, we go to the size, and we call it at 30. Then we say, okay, well, the last thing that needs to be done is we say that the font style needs to be bold. So we go to font style and we then go to bold. What is important with font style? It's the square brackets, okay? And I always sort of go with my gut on this. If you can't remember what the font style is, right? Always just remember that we want to do something to the font style. So before we actually say what style it needs to be, we want to call it FS. Please just bring your attention to that because this FS is sometimes one of the biggest things we forget. Okay. Is there any questions in the form active up? The on active when we ran this? Cool. So I'm guessing the, the quiet means that I can carry on. Okay. Then when we click the button show, okay, this is how my form changed. It, it populated my image over here with the green, with my green pool. Okay. 
And let's check what, the, what it asks us to do. It asks us to change the stretch property of the image to true, and it asks us to make the image now visible. So instead of having the picture as visible false, we're now going to change it to the opposite to true. And how do we stretch the image? We call the image, okay? We actually call the physical component. We go to the stretch property and we enable it to true. Cool. Then we go to the button change. So these are the things, these are the instructions that were given. When we click the button change, all of a sudden we have this magical blue water. You needed to change the caption. So we went to our label, we went to the caption property and we changed it to that's there. We then removed the bold from that label, okay? As you can see, we then go to the actual label component, we go to font and we go to style. We then just have to remember that inside our square brackets over here, generally we would physically have a font style. When we remove something from that font style, it is no font style called font style remove. Okay, you can't go into Word and, and go into underline. To undo that underline, you must say the same thing right? You click the same button. In Delphi, all that you do to undo a font style is create a blank square bracket. Because all that's going to happen is it's going to say, well, no style needs to be displayed. So it's going to be empty. Then they ask you to change the color of the label's font to aqua. You literally go, let's call my label, look at the font property, I want to change the color of that font, and I want to call it aqua. As you can see before the actual word aqua, we use the letter CL. Obviously, I'm sure you can put two and two together. It stands for color, which is always a little bit um, of a nice way to learn. When we're talking about font style, we always put FS before the actual style. And when we're talking about color, we always put CL before the actual color. Then it asks you to load the picture of the clear water. Um, and that picture's name is clear JPEG. So we go to the picture component. We call that picture component. We then want to access the picture property. And once we've accessed that picture property, we're then going to say, okay, well, load this picture property from somewhere. And what must be loaded? The clear JPEG must be loaded from your file. Can I just make a suggestion? Um, just in case you couldn't get this. Always remember that when we want to load the picture from the file, this JPEG over here, I'm oh, sorry, this JPEG over here, just remember that this has to be in the same folder as your Delphi program when you did that save all, okay, as the units and the project. Please just remember that when you save this image, you need to save it in that folder that has all the other files that you need to use to run this program. Cool. Then we get something and then they ask you to, res to enable the reset button. And we're then going to just say that this button, when it's enabled, it needs to be true. Awesome. I know I'm boring you. I promise we're going to get done now. Then we're going to look at the new work. So now this is the form that then comes up when we click the reset button. Okay. And what the, um, the question asked you to do was reset all the objects on the form to the state it was when you first ran the program. So basically what needs to happen is if when we did our form on active, what was the first thing that we had? We needed to have that the reset button enabled is false. So we go to our reset button and we need to make sure that our reset button 
when it's enabled equals false. Yes, someone raised their hand. Um, don't you just, we can unmute and just check. Let's just quickly check here. Um, I see you on, don't you want to quickly send me, sorry, let me just go like this. I'm just going to pause that just to go to my chat. Um, I see that you can't unmute, so you can. Don't you want to send me a message or the question that you have in the group chat? Okay, well, just while I wait for the chat to come up, I'm just going to carry on a little. Okay, so I'm going to carry on sharing my screen. Um, I'm just waiting for the, the chat to come up. So I'm just going to carry on. I'm sure everyone can now see that the chat's there. So I hope that everyone can just see. Okay, but you can still see the code. So we're still working in the reset button. Okay, perfect. So now we just want to make sure that everything that was on the first form, okay, is exactly like it was. So my suggestion would be to make sure that that was the case. Every um, change that you made throughout the program, you're almost going to reverse that um, that property change. You're physically going to change all the component properties back to what they were in the beginning. So start on the form on active and all the changes that you made here, fix them back to how they were. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. So are there any questions um, with regards to the homework that you had to do? Or is everyone good? Okay, so just while people are typing me messages, I'm just going to put this here so that you can see. Okay, so this is just another extension activity that I thought was really good. And I'm actually going to be going over this with you in the next lesson. But essentially what this revision activity does is it takes everything that you've done up until this point, okay, and it summarizes it into one activity. So if there was ever going to be a homework that you thought, mm, I'm not going to do this one, please make sure it's not this question because it's so beneficial to have one program that accesses all the concepts that we've covered in the last few weeks. Okay. It covers cases, it covers changing dynamic properties, it covers being able to, let me read you some of these. Okay, so it asks you to cover radio groups. It asks you to store inputs different ways, okay? The questions are here. So um, the questions is from the, Delph, the Dandelion textbook is on page 80 and 81, but I've included them here. What I will do is I will attach them in the file just before we, just before we leave so that you have them as well. Okay, cool. But the questions are on this, this slide over here. So I've put the questions all in over there. Okay, so those are the, those are the four slides that have the questions on. So it's questions one, two, and three. Then we've got four, five, and six, four, five, six, and seven over here. Okay. I know it might look a little bit daunting, and I will go over it. Please don't stress too much. Okay. Um, I just think it's a good idea to 
allow you to also remember what you've done before we sort of move on to a completely new concept. Okay, so this is eight, nine, and 10. Okay, and then we get 11, then this is question two, and we get question three. I just want to bring your attention to something. So when we go over this activity, just keep in mind that although there's three buttons that we're going to be programming, I am just going to give you a hint to say that um, there are other codes that we add on the form active that isn't necessarily stipulated in any of the questions from this activity. But you'll see what I mean tomorrow when we log on again. Okay, so let's start something new. Or let's sort of just go over what you know already. So I know that you've looked at algorithms already. I don't plan on teaching you algorithms again. I just wanted to engage about what algorithms actually are and, and how do we link algorithms to the actual Delphi code or the theory behind what happens in the background, okay? So an algorithm is a series of steps a program must follow, okay, the pseudocode which can be understood by any programmer, no matter what language they're coding in. I'm sure you know by now, Delphi is one of millions and trillions of um, coding languages that we get, okay? So what we do with algorithms is it's a way that no matter what you want to do and what language you're using, you still get to the end product. Okay, I just want to show you something um, that you may not have seen before. It's this little note over here. So while there are no specific rules about how we write these algorithms, okay, it must meet certain criteria. So obviously, the more steps the algorithm has, potentially the more difficult it's going to be to actually complete that task. So when we have these steps, we need to make sure that every single one of these steps actually um, pertains to certain qualities. Because if these qualities are problematic, the end product might not actually be what we wanted it to be when we started this idea. Okay, that is where we're going with this now. So, Another thing that I need to bring to your attention that I think is so important is each step should consist of a single task. And now you're going to go, thanks, ma'am. You're reading the slide as if I can't do that. Okay, I get it. I just need to bring your attention to that very, very boldly. Because when we move on to flow charts, you'll begin to understand why that statement is so vital. Okay, so we've looked at algorithms. When we want to create an algorithm, how do we make sure that the algorithm does what it's supposed to do? Well, there's six defining steps, okay? And I've made them short, sweet, to the point. We need to understand the problem we need to define the solution that we're working towards, okay? We need to define the inputs and we need to design a, step, a set of steps to complete the task. So what we are going to be looking at in the rest of this lesson is number four. We are going to look at a set of steps to complete the task, okay? Then we get to testing the algorithm and updating the algorithm. So let's break this down into a simple Delphi activity that you do for homework, okay? Let's look at the one that we started off in the beginning with the water. What is the first thing that we need to know? What was the problem? The problem was that someone had some dirty pool water that we wanted to fix, okay? That was what we understood from the problem. What was, the what was the desired solution? Well, the solution to that was taking this green water and changing it to blue water. Literally, as simple as that, okay? But then we needed, to, we needed to define what inputs that needed to have. Well, 
are we going to be able to change green water into blue water that we don't have? No, we are going to have to take some sort of green water in to output some sort of blue water. So step number four is where it becomes so critical. Because what are the steps that need to actually happen between number two and number three? If you don't know the steps between number two and number three, are you going to be able to actually create this algorithm? No. Okay. So when we talk about flowcharts, these are the these are the set of steps that we need to complete the task. Cool. Then we get testing the algorithm. So once we've decided what these steps were that we needed to to change, let me just men mention some of the steps that needed to change to complete the gr the green water to blue water was purely just changing the picture from green to blue because we are not pool people, we are IT people, okay? Our solution may have been a little bit more easy than the people actually dealing with the pool. So how did we test the algorithm? Had for number five, okay? Does anyone wanna actually hazard the guess? How do we, sitting in our classroom or sitting in front of the computer, actually test that algorithm? Let's see if someone answers me. Okay, no one wants to answer me. It's okay. Trial and error. Okay, I'll take it. But when we're sitting in front of our, um, when we're sitting in front of our computer, when we start that trial and error process, how do we actually engage in that trial and error process when we're sitting in Delphi? There's one word. It's one button that we click. F9, what does F9 do? What is the word F9? Okay, it runs the program. Thank you. Look at you go, guys. Testing the algorithm is literally when we click that debug button or when we click the run button with the green triangle on the top. Because what happens when we've clicked that button? It runs through all those steps that you've hard coded and it either gives you an error, okay? And gives you that red line that we all dread, okay? Or the Delphi gods have shone upon you. And number six, the sixth step then doesn't occur. Because do any updates then need to happen if we can just run the program? No. The sixth step only occurs when we want to update the program because we've done something wrong. Boom. Look at us go. Genius. Okay. So now we're going to actually look at these flowcharts. Okay. But now you're going to tell me, okay, what do flowcharts and algorithms have to do with each other? Basically, it comes down to one concept. Flowcharts are the pictorial representation of the algorithm you are creating. You are going to create some sort of picture, some sort of diagram, okay, that physically represents what is going to happen in the algorithm. So you're going to get two parts of an algorithm. You get the picture side and you get the code side. And a lot of people, when they've started out with this IT, that they may not, they might be a little bit hesitant or they're still a little bit unsure, flowcharts might be the solution to anyone's problem. I'm a major fan of flowcharts, but some people think it's really silly because it's redundant, because you almost do the same thing twice, which I completely agree. But you might find that flowcharts 
make sure that you have some sort of logical idea of the end pro uh, process. Cool. So let's look at the actual components, okay? Because now we need to actually know when we talk about the shape, each shape has a function. So for an example, you can't put end, okay? We can't put end in a, in a diamond, okay? When we talk about a diamond, we only talk about the decision, okay? So just know that every single element and function has its own shape. So to indicate the start and the end of an algorithm, we purely write the words start and or we write the words begin and end, okay? Start or finish, it doesn't matter. You purely just need to understand that there is going to be some sort of shape and in that shape, it needs to be the word begin or end, start or finish, however you want to go, okay? Cool. Then we get something called an input and an output. This is where it gets a little bit tricky, okay? Lots of people co get confused between inputs and outputs and instructions. But I have a little bit of a trick that should help you along the way. So an input shows when data is added to the algorithm or given to the user. Okay, what does that mean? Let's say for an example, in my Delphi program, I want to physically get the name of the person using this program. So when we look at the shape for inputs and outputs, we need to make sure that that shape, for an example, has the writing on the inside, gets user's name. And it's literally as simple as that. I've got three examples that we will run through. So don't stress too much about that now. We're just looking at the, the actual components. Then we get something called an instruction. So this is, a, this is an, an instruction that um, the algorithm must follow. So now I just want to go back quickly. Okay. I don't know if any of you realized, but over here, when I asked you to look at that extension um, exercise, can you see I used the word instruction or changes? Okay. I did that on purpose. If you didn't notice, it's okay. Okay. I wouldn't have either. But Essentially, every single one of the instructions that are given in that activity, okay, if it's not an input or an output, it goes in a rectangle. So then what is the difference? What would then, and hello, don't you have like an intro video of grade 10 IT? Okay, um, can I get back to that? In a second, let me just quickly finish um, the flow charts for the kids that are on here. And then um, I'll get back to you in five seconds. Let's just quickly finish going through the flow charts. Cool. So let's look here now quickly. So what is the difference between an input and an output and an instruction? So I want to get the person's name. So an input would be get user's name. But now I want to do something with that user's name. Let's say um, we'll do functions later on, so don't stress too much. But let's say we want to change all the letters in that user's name to capital letters. The instruction in the next step will be change user's name into caps. And that is how you tell the difference between an input and output or an instruction, okay? Essentially, there's one question that needs to be asked. Is the, is the, for inputs and outputs, is the program getting information in or get, giving information out? If the answer to is that yes or no or yes or no, if it's yes, it's an input or an output. If it's no, it's an instruction. Cool. Then we get something called the decision. This is where it gets a little bit more tricky and some of your um, logical senses need to come through here. 
when we have a decision, how many options for a decision would we normally have? Let's check. Anyone want to guess how many options do we actually have when we think of a decision? Okay, no one wants to hazard a guess at this one. Essentially, we only have two options. We either are going to do the thing we're deciding on, or we are not going to do the thing we are deciding on. I hope that makes sense. So let's say you're hungry. I mean, there could be a million options to this, but essentially you are hungry. Do you eat or don't you eat? There could be a million decisions within those two but essentially it comes down to two objects. You're either going to eat or you're not gonna eat. Does that make sense? Cool. So when we talk about a decision, there is always two parts, a true or a false, a yes or a no. Okay, it's either going to go one way or it's going to go the other way. And then finally, we get something called a connector. And these connect one element of the algorithm to the next element. So for an example, if we have a begin and then an input, there will be an arrow between begin and input. Before I run over any of the examples, are there any questions on the function and the shapes of these flowcharts? Cool, no questions, let's move on. Okay, I hope you can see this. I think it might be a little bit blurry, but I think you get the picture, okay? You just need to see how it looks for now. I'll read it to you. Okay, so it says, swapping contents of two containers flowchart. Literally, as simple as that, we are taking one container and we're putting stuff in it from another container. Perfect. So it says, here's a flowchart of an algorithm that you can use to swap the contents of container A, that contains milk, with the contents of B, which contains water. What is the first thing that we do? Well, we have to begin. Okay, and can we just go back? Is the begin in the right shape? Yes, it is. Sorted. The next thing that we want to do is we physically want to actually say, okay, now that I've started, let's go somewhere. What allows us to say, let's go somewhere? The arrow. So we get the first instruction. Why is this an instruction? Am I getting information in or out? No. I'm physically going to say, Am I getting information in? Yes or no? No. I'm just deciding on getting an empty container to help me move all these other contents. So it's an instruction. Get a third empty container C. Once I've done that, I must pour the contents of container A into container C. So essentially, I want to pour the milk into my empty container. Could I have poured the water into my empty container? 100%. So another thing that you need to know, are there is no one specific answer for flowcharts. There could be many, many, many options. But what is necessarily true, and I told you I was gonna come back to it, is can you see that get a third empty container and pour the contents of the one container into the empty container. Each of those are a single step. Can you notice that we have not used a joining word? Things like and, things like or, things, things that are going to almost allow you to add two steps separately, okay? 
when we con when we um, construct these flow charts, the biggest thing that we have to remember is that we're going to do one step into another step. So as long as there is a single step to a single step, we are good. And that's basically the algorithm. We are literally going to get an empty container, pour the milk or the water into the empty container, pour the other milk or water. Okay, let's say we started with milk. So we're gonna pour the milk into the empty container. We are then going to pour the water into the milk's container. And once we've done that, we want to empty the other container of water back into the milk's container. I hope I haven't confused you, but the logic just needs to be there. Please don't focus on what container we're using where, okay? I need you to focus on the instructions. Cool. Then this is where this is now, where it becomes very tricky, and this is where we've got a decision. As you can see, boom, here it is, okay? So this is where it says determining whether a person is male or female using their ID numbers. Okay, so this flow chart is used to determine whether a person is male or female using the seventh digit in the ID number. If the seventh digit is greater than four, the person is male, otherwise the person is female. So this is something that I discussed with my class when we were still at school, however many years ago, okay? It's literally as important as this, in case you didn't know this. Your ID numbers are not just random numbers that get put together. I'm sure by now you've realized that the first six is your birthday, but every number thereafter actually represents you as a human being in South Africa. It's mind-blowing. Okay, cool. So let's look at this algorithm. The first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we can begin, okay? Then we think, okay, now that I want to start my program, what is the first thing that needs to happen? Well, I can't make any decision on whether they're male or female without actually having the digit to determine whether we're male or female. Cool. So now we've got that digit in. And can you just see, please make sure Look at what shape is being displayed here. When I ask someone for, the, for their ID number and, and I'm getting that seventh digit in, am I getting information in? Yes, so it's an input. Cool. In the next step, we want to actually find out, is this digit greater than four? If it's greater than four, we need to display male. If it's not greater than four, we can display female. So in this example, we've used true and false. But nothing stops us from saying yes or no. That's something, so let's think of this in a yes or no situation. Is the digit greater than four? Yes. If it's yes, it would be true. So it would be male. If it's no, it would be false and it would be female. Another thing I just want to bring to your attention is can you see the arrow flow between displaying male and female? Nothing stops you from just joining, okay? Yes. Someone raised their hand. Okay, I'm just going to quickly start finishing up. Nothing stops you from joining those arrows differently here at the bottom. But what is important, you need to just have made sure that the arrow coming from when we've displayed male to ending happens after we've displayed female. Because if we had have put this arrow over here, okay, say for instance, I'd have put the arrow in over there, it would have displayed male and female. Okay, because the output then is going to be true for both. Please just make sure it's important where you put these arrows. Okay, so this is the third example. And this is determining the area of a rectangle. Okay, and this is now we can see the difference between an input and an output and your actual instruction. So if we want to if we want to determine the length of the rectangle, uh, the area of the rectangle, we need our length 
and we need our breadth. So we write two instructions, we write two inputs to get length, get breadth. We then want to physically give the instruction to calculate the area. The area is length times breadth. Once that instruction has occurred, we then want to just tell the person what the area is for the length and the breadth that they've given us. And then it comes to an end. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I hope I haven't confused anyone, but it's a really helpful um, task to know these flow charts at the end. Okay, so these are the, this is the activity that I want you to do, okay? I have attached a link over here. I just want to go to the link quickly. So it's number four. And I don't know if you have this textbook yet or not, but it's the Siavula grade 10 IT textbook, okay? And you can access it through this link. And it's a physical grade 10 textbook. It's a PDF version. It's free. And this link will physically give you um, that PDF link for you to download, okay? And that is the question that I've asked you to do over here. So it's on that grade 10 IT practical textbook. It's on page 11. But if you aren't going to be um, in a situation to be able to download that, I've also put the questions up on the slides. So question one is draw a flow chart for the following algorithms. Okay, making hot chocolate, crossing the street, finding the area of the circle, um, entering a contact into your phone. These are things that we deal with every single day of our lives. But trust me, to try and make sense of the logical order to do these things is a lot more difficult than you think. Okay, and then question two, I give you this flow chart over here and I want you to decide whether or not it makes sense. How can it be changed? Is there anything missing? Yeah, okay. And, I'm, and I literally finished by the time that we finished. Okay, so I'm done for today. We are good to go. Um, in the next time, I'm gonna go over the extension and finalizing all these flow charts. Okay, um, and if you want more information, please contact African Team Geeks. But that's me, I'm done for today. Um, I'll stay behind for five minutes if anyone wants to ask me something personally. But I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Cool.